All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to our clean call today. I'm Rab Anderson. I am head of education and storytelling at ACE, Action for the Climate Emergency. She, her pronouns, um, and I'm facilitating today. And it looks like uh, we are, after we do announcements, we're going to be discussing providing support and community for teachers in their current situation with facing, facing climate crises and overlapping crises of our COVID pandemic. So that feels like a very needed and timely conversation. But let's start with announcements. So anyone have announcements? Well, I'll give, I'll, I'll do a preliminary, it's a preliminary announcement because I don't have any link yet, but I'm involved with AAAS. I'm actually secretary of the education section. And one of the initiatives that the education section has taken on is to create a webinar series um, of four webinars featuring for the most part, AAAS fellows. The overarching theme will be equity and justice. And um, each of the, each of the different, uh, each of the different uh, webinars will be a panel of a couple of people in various aspects of science education. So it's not exclusively climate science, but um, the one that I'm going to be um, organizing is one on addressing these issues in higher ed. And one of the panelists I'm hoping will be in the health sciences and one in the climate sciences, cl both education, health science education and climate science education. So um, I will, when, once we actually have it all firmed up, I'll send out a link, but that's just a heads up that this is going to be happening. Cool. When is it, Tamara, do you know roughly? Well, I think that we tentatively have set the first one for October and then approximately every few months. So there'll be um, two in the fall and two in the spring. Cool, thank you. Gina, I see your hand. Hello, uh, everyone probably knows what I'm going to say, but register for the Excel Summit, please, if you have not already, and please share it. Um, we have some exciting speakers that are starting to get lined up, and um, you won't want to miss it, so register. <laughs> get your people to register. I will. Thanks, Gina. Anyone else? Announcements? We're good. Wendy, did you all do your teachers um, PD workshops this summer? We did. We got through both our Project Ocean course and our Project Atmosphere course with the, the interesting times of 2022 travels and worrying about COVID outbreaks and survived both and had great experiences. So congrats! I'm breathing easier and lots of teachers know a lot more about atmospheric and physical oceanography topics and data sets. Great. Congrats. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for asking. It's, um, boy, every, you know, those of us involved in education, especially if it involves teacher PD outside the classroom, Everyone says, oh, summer, you know, break time. I'm like, oh, not in our world. <laughs> there's never a good time. Yeah, no. Uh, there's a few days here, a few days there, as we talked about. But no, it's great. It was the, such great teachers and just so forever impressed with the teachers that sought professional development. I mean, rigorous professional development, big commitments in these times. It's a special group that still got the energy or capacity or you know, ability to take PD in these times, so. Yeah, that's awesome. And hi, John, welcome. We're just doing any announcements from the group before we go into our discussion today. Were you saying Sean? Were you talking to me? Yes, hi. Oh, it's Sean, yeah. Um, welcome. I, can I throw in an announcement? I know I, Absolutely. I watch this group, but you know, I don't show up a lot in your meetings because I always conflict with something else. So I just jumped in again, but yeah, uh, I really want to emphasize what was just said about the teachers taking on really rigorous commitments. We have right now, what's happening concurrently is we have uh, cohorts of clean transportation fellows. We have water power fellows and Pacific Northwest clean energy fellows. And they, um, are right now building hydrogen fuel cell cars in our other group right now. So 
they're like taking on big plans for dealing with the infrastructure and energy investments and adding that, taking that very seriously. And we're, they just, it's moving. And we have a position opening I posted in the network. So if anyone knows anyone that wants to work in the Pacific Northwest, I could share the link in the chat um, too. But that's my quick update. And thank you again. And uh, happy to hear more. Of course, glad to have you. And we all we all make it when we can. I don't think any of us has a perfect attendance record, except maybe you, Gina. Um, and John, where are you? What is BEF? I see it in your name there. Oh, sure. BEF, uh, it's an entrepreneurial nonprofit that works on, on climate, energy, and water solutions, a lot of times at the nexus of climate, energy, and water. And so we um, have we're, we, we basically start every meeting by saying we, you know, our climate, water, and energy challenges are urgent and solvable. Join us, you know. So we're we're starting with that, working with all sectors of society, um, some that aren't traditionally thought about when you're trying to engage in climate and environmental things. So we're working with all kinds of folks, um, and so we have uh, environmental commodities that fund and provide unrestricted funds for programs. But then we also do a lot of uh, philanthropic agreements, work with utilities, work with developers, work with watershed groups all over the country. And so, so there's a lot to say about that, but I just run our CE Clean Energy Bright Futures program. So the in the energy solutions side, the social side of the clean energy transition, we want to make sure that's equitable, accessible to everyone, and that all young people can see themselves as participating and benefiting from and leading in an equitable clean energy future. And so I love clean. We're always promoting the resources here. And I also work with Mike Arkin and Remy Pangle. Mike Arkin's at Kidwind and Remy's at Repowering Schools. And there's a clean energy education, loose, very loose network of people that not, I'm actually literally emailing them right before hopping on this call about like, how do we get all these efforts? I talked with Frank too, Frank Nipold about that is like, there's all these efforts going on and more starting in the energy industry is really stepping up and creating more of these networks. And it's like, okay, okay, networks everywhere. I'm curious, how do we bring this all together? Um, and some mm. of these conversations that are happening in clean, which is like all encompassing of climate solutions. And then there's some of us dealing deep in energy, some in water, mm -hmm. some in other sustainability. So how do we pull all that together? I'm, that's why I'm trying to stay involved um, because I'm really, I, I, you know, I don't want to talk too much, but I'm trying to figure that out. And so BEF specialty is literally those kinds of things. Not that we need to lead it. We just want to, we're the, really good at connecting and leveraging and pushing new stuff forward. And when it takes a life of its own, we back off and push on the next thing. So that's sort of mm -hmm. our role here. Interesting. It sounds like maybe this could be a future clean discussion topic around that, especially with the passage of the IRA. Like what, is there like a sub, a subcommittee? I hate that term, but like, you know, a working group or something, or like, what does it look like to, could clean support in organizing like a, a clean energy education working group or coalition yeah. group? So we have a group and it's like, how can the structure clean has, and you're so well established and we're not, we're just like a hundred different folks all over the country, all been working on energy ed since the seventies, some of us. So it's like, not me I, since the nineties for me, but you know, uh, that, that's a very robust area, but it kind of gets siloed. And so how do we de-silo that? And so I'd love it if that was a conversation, I would totally bring that to the clean people that rotate around, you know, DOE, NREL, all the national labs in those universities associated with energy solutions specifically. So it's like, can we, how do we do that? It would love if we could maybe mm -hmm. create a joint discussion that was low barrier to participate, low commitment, but just talk first and yeah. then figure out what to do next, I guess. Cause there's all these networks, IREC and Renewables Forward and all the state and local and regional groups. It's, it's a little dizzying. <laughs> yeah, and that's one thing um, Clean has a hard time with is getting the energy side of things. We're really solid with climate education, but energy education we're we have a lot of energy education resources, but in terms of network side of things, we're definitely lacking. So um, mm -hmm. I have been recently trying harder to figure out how to get that side a little bit more. We we worked a little bit with the Kidwin group um, and they seem really fantastic. Um, but other than that, 
we've we've been lacking. So um, yeah, maybe we dedicate a call to that or something. Yeah, let's see if we can get those folks um, because from every corner of the country, they're in this group. And so they are talking, but we're we're a little, I'm, I, we're getting so many um, opportunities coming that could barely keep up. So it's a little bit hectic at the moment, but it would be uh, really sure. great to talk about this because I, I always talk about energy solutions as under the umbrella of larger climate solutions, right? So it's like, right. that's how the teachers think about it. And so how can right. we pull those groups together? I think we keep mentioning that we want, it's like, how do you get these waves in sync with each other? That's really what I think we're trying to figure out. Mm, okay. <laughs> And maybe even, sorry, I, I feel like I might keep interrupting someone, but um, I hope it's okay to say this, Sean, but Sean will be giving a night talk um, at the Excel Summit uh, on the, 20, the 21st. So, and there'll be breakout room following that. So maybe even at that event, they, that might be kind of a starting point even where we could have some kind of new collaboration happening. Uh, but I'm putting that out there as well. Awesome. I think it's also, I just want to make note that like the Inflation Direction Act is getting signed into law very soon. I think it's 3.30 mm -hmm. Eastern, Biden signing it like kind of cool that we are here together on this day for the first historic passage of major climate legislation in our country with uh -huh. with all of its faults and flaws and sh I'm just going to say it shitty shitty parts I it's, still, to, it's still monumental I should reach out to Frank Grandshaw because he was here last week and was going to reach out to someone he knew about giving a clean presentation about the IRA because that was a huge topic of interest last week. Uh, but then we were like, we need someone who actually who knows and can break it down for us to talk about it. So he might be getting someone for us, which would be exciting. Okay. That would be cool. I mean, there is, well, it's not, there's nothing education specific in it, as far as I know, like if there's estimated like a million and a half jobs that are going to be created from this law, then like there's got to be education and job training to get us there. So there isn't, but there is. Yeah. So should we transition to the, the discussion topic around support for teachers with overlapping crises of climate and COVID? And I, I think I missed the impetus for this discussion. So if anyone was in on that call that, that planted the seeds for this, or Gina, do you, do you have any framing you wanna give? Yeah, so the topics that I've been using for the informal discussions this summer have come from the uh, social network analysis, actually, when people were surveyed earlier this year, these topics were specifically mentioned as things people wanted to talk about. So it is highly unlikely that the person who actually suggested that is here, but they could be. Um, it was anonymous, so I can't really tell. Um, so it was just something that was suggested. If um, the conversation evolves or something, we don't need to stay on that topic, but it was more of a suggestion. And um, if folks have ideas, definitely you can dive in. Cool. I can um, share one thing that we're doing at ACE, which is that we've got a campaign running right now called Let's Talk About It, which is about climate and mental health and climate anxiety. Um, and so um, as part of that campaign, um, we're doing some um, teacher resource development, but um, what, it, what it has actually morphed into is um, doing a teacher survey around teachers and climate anxiety. Um, and so that feels really relevant here because um, with them having to teach about climate as well as other, all the other challenges teachers are facing. Um, so we are, um, we're working on this survey with, um, and we have a new person at ACE who is our director of research and experimentation. So she's got a social science background. So she's designing the survey 
um, her name's Leanne Sangalang, and um, she is partnering with um, a woman, Susan Worcester, professor at the College of Worcester, who was one of the co-authors on the big um, study that came out like right before COP last year from the University of Bath that was around, like it was like an international um, survey of young people and climate and mental health. Um, so we're pulling, we're like collaborating with her and pulling some of the questions that they used from their study so that we can do this um, comparison of like where teachers are on their um, mental health related to teaching climate. Um, Cause I think there's this really interesting, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but like teachers as having this like weight and burden of being the messengers for teaching young people about climate. Um, and then at the same time, in some situations, having their hands tied in terms of not being able to teach about solutions, especially ones that like border on civics or activism. Um, so, so that's a little bit of what we want to dive into, but um, it's going through IRB right now at University of uh, the College of Worcester. But it would be great if, um, I don't know how many of you folks have teacher networks and if you'd be willing to send the survey out to them or even in a newsletter or something, that would be awesome. Yeah, I see some of you nodding. Um, it'd be great to get a good number of respondents on this. And I think that will help us like, in, you know, do this more of this um, knowledge building around where teachers are at on this topic and, and then helping us ideate like what, what they need to support them. Yeah, I think we're gonna be putting out the survey sometime in September. Can I, maybe I can just make a note on folks who said they would. I've got you, Wendy. I think I have Ingrid, your email. Let me just check. I think I saw you nod. I say the way for us to do it best by far is social media. We don't do newsletters, but we can reach a lot of people with our social media. Okay. There is, there is a teacher newsletter that goes out in the AMS though. So I just not run by our department. So I can share that okay. with them. Sean, I think you said you posted something to clean recently. So if, that, if that's the case, I think I probably have your, yeah. Actually, I just looked at your job opening. Perfect. And Gina, thank you. Was that was that you that you can share it out, Gina? Yeah, um, I was just gonna say, definitely use the theme listserv if that feels like a good fit. And then if I have the link, I can put it in our social and newsletter uh, calendars. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Let's see. I see a few hands up, but I don't know. So my first. hand is up, but it's, I, I want to build on your theme. Mine's just a sharing a bit of good news, which can happen at any time. Okay. Ingrid? Um, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll go ahead then. Um, when I first saw Gina's email today with a topic, it made me think of imagining a situation like, suppose you were a teacher whose school had been burned down in a wildfire or you were flooded out, you know, you were directly physically impacted by some climate or weather disaster. Um, and how would you get the help you need or what, what would you want? How would you communicate with people about help you need? And I, I think, I mean, obviously there are state resources or there's uh, places like GoFundMe sort of sadly for people who have to do their own private fundraising if there aren't enough state resources or federal um, and I, I've seen you know teachers I haven't seen climate related climate disaster related things on GoFundMe but I've seen teachers fundraising for other things which again I think is kind of sad <laughs> that it's not publicly funded but um, it just made me wonder like what how would we find out about teachers' needs in that kind of situation, or what could we do? Um, is there something through the clean listserv, maybe, where we could just pose that question and say, "Are you a teacher who's been affected by climate disaster? Do you need help? You know, please feel free to post here, and then kind of see what happens." Um, I don't know. It might be more effective to 
to, to, you can do that, but I would, since the clean network is a lot of people like us who aren't the teachers themselves, but mm -hmm. have networks of teachers it, to ask them to share it with the, yeah. with the appropriate, to the appropriate audience. Mm -hmm. So that was all. I don't have any solution yeah. to suggest, but I, um, I was curious. Like you know of places where teachers go for this kind of community question and answer or seeking help. I remember, we did a lot of that response after Sandy in New Jersey and New York City with the schools we worked with there. Mm -hmm. It feels like a long time ago now. I occasionally see teachers asking for help in uh, both, especially smaller geoscience education entities, not always directly as a result of a weather or climate disaster, um, but it does come up and I, I see it on like Twitter feeds or Facebook appeals where teachers will say, I'm in a tough spot and the tough spots can be caused by any number of things. Sometimes it was COVID, which is part of our suggested topic today too, but, um, or they're being thrown into teaching tomorrow on topic X related mm -hmm. to geosciences. And they, they just say, you know, a cut 24 hours or a week to figure this out, looking for best tips and then teachers tend to answer. So they do seem to leverage social media looking for resources. So it brings up the interesting question of d does clean see those kinds of appeals and do do we respond as clean saying here's a place to look and the web's a big place but I think one of the places I see it the most might be the Nesta feed because mm -hmm. earth science is small and unique and and compared to you know physics and bio and all those places. And since mm. Nesta is just earth science, but I, I think that's one of the places I've seen those kind of appeals. Sometimes it just shows up straight up in Twitter due to things that come flying across my feed due to some bot telling me I need to see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean. Um, that, so I'm curious if Clean or Ace would do, this might seem silly, but a PSA to get it out to other networks outside of these, you know, I would like Nesta, NSTA, and maybe that's what you were saying when you said Nesta. I tend to say NSTA. Okay. And all the statewide ones. No, no, um, Nesta, no I think Nesta, it's Nesta, earth Nesta. science teachers. Oh, yeah. earth science. Okay. So great. And or there's just the all the science teacher associations actually, right? There's chemistry, everything. And then um I was wondering, you know with, I don't know how it is in every area, but in Oregon, we had schools and some of our fellows had half their whole community burned down, you know, and the Oregon Community Foundation definitely had grants specifically focused on helping in those communities. And I'm curious about the roles of community foundations and then regular media, which it needs to be a kind of story that gets their attention and those who work in comms know how to do that. But it would be nice that the call to action was and check out clean because I don't know that everyone knows if that's where you decide to post it. Is there a campaign like a campaign you can create for that because um, one of the things that and I have a two parter response because I'm thinking of that, and then the other half of it is how are we messaging and so when we talk about this is a problem, this is a problem or show maps of all the disparities on top of disparities on top of disparities and impacts on top of impacts it's like. I was actually just instructing our fellows say, it's great to look at that. We need to know that's where the pain points are and we need to have the solution right next to that. We don't want students or anyone, the teachers, everyone being piled on with problem, 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 problem and the solutions not nearby, right? So it's like when we do these PSAs or when we do whatever social, it's like can the, the seed or the, the foundation of the messaging be a little more solutions oriented and there's more than activism, activism is important but there's so many things to be in part of uh, climate solutions, like speaking out in all these places where they ask for public opinion on land development, energy, all the stuff in energy development and redistribution of the grid and all that is going to be requiring that. And so that's a different way to be engaged without saying activists, so to get those people out. But anyway, my point is, can the messaging come from, you know, this is a problem and here's a solution right next to it versus problem, 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 and then we want to make sure folks know about the solution. So question is, 
get to how do you want to do a campaign? Where do you want to post it so it lives somewhere so we can all point to it and then use our networks to get the word out? So that's kind of what I was thinking. My mind is definitely going to some of those, the, a lot of the mutual aid networks that popped up after COVID, of like sharing resources or how to find resources. Um, and a lot of those were like at the very local level. Wendy, did you still have your hand up or was that a, is that a relic? I no, I still a hand up for some time, just sharing a bit of good news, but it's not really probably discussion, so. Okay, let's go to Jim and then we want to hear your good news. Okay. Yes, always, thank you, thank you, uh, Robin. Always want to hear your good news, Wendy. Um, let's see, people have heard of this before, but uh, probably the most direct example we engage in Mobile Climate Science Labs with um, working with communities that are directly impacted by climate induced disasters and problems. Um, in the North Bay of the Bay Area, where some of the worst fires have been in California, where people have been killed, where homes have been left, um, that that very much intersects with the work of STEM-based education on the on the district and regional level. Um, as in so much happens in the Bay Area, and now so much happens could happen in other parts of the country where STEM education is not really up to the par it used to be lacking in, in um, labs and interactivity and, and work, the science festivals have taken over, or at least you know, work to fill in the gap. So there are these large events, and specifically there's a National North Bay Science Discovery Day. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm saying is the very location where the North Bay Science Discovery Day is held, the Sonoma County Fairground, is also the evacuation center mm -hmm. when those areas get on fire so literally we've had day we've had days that are closed down or you know we're having it and in come the fire trucks right and people are dying a couple miles away right well these events and us specifically look to be for resiliency of these communities for the schools for the places that after the fires the the schools are still able to do education and come in and and, and reach out and have a sense of communities rebuilding, so that's that's been a very direct and very emotional and very powerful. Um, when typically the fire departments would do booths next to us, well, all the fire departments are being busy, right? <laughs> they're they're out on trucks, but yet there's people we've called in from the Berkeley Fire Department. So they they that's part of an extra thing they do. They bring in their volunteers and other work. Anyway, it's it can be uh, quite powerful on that one. Um, another area is in COVID. Um, COVID also drove a lot of the Zoom and, and being able to work remotely. And there's a good side of that is now it's quite possible for schools, classes to enter, to connect with each other um, across the country. And, and that's something we take part in is having ways in which our young people are, can, are getting very good at giving Zoom presentations and can talk with different groups um, across the country. So, you know, that's that's a silver lining in the in the storm. Anyway, sorry for going on for so long. So. Oh, no, no need to apologize for that. We want to hear that. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. So um, it's a broad topic that we laid out for informal discussion. And um, it's interesting thinking about, so weather disasters often impact individual schools, a tornado, a flood, and um, you hear about schools or teachers in need, but it tends to be a very individual request. And so it's interesting thinking about that past experience in my career as you scale it up to the broader impact of a climate disaster. And not that it matters, a teacher's in need, whether it's a flood that hits one school or district, a state, you know, the entire Mississippi River, which happened before climate change too, but it, I love the idea of clean thinking about some sort of strategic approach for tackling perhaps broader scale need and support and access to recess as impacted by the things that we care about. Because um, for the rest of our careers and lives, that will be a relevant topic in need. So my good news was just a small thing in a, a world where it's hard to find those good news moments. Um, 
we have been successful carving out more corporate and uh, grant support to directly fund teachers than we have been in the past. And I think that's a direct outcome of both doing our homework, showing we're doing the work, but also COVID made people a little more sympathetic to the fact that teachers are probably at their breaking point. I mean, they were before COVID, and then you put COVID on top of it, and then climate change, just the increasing pressures of being that messenger in the classroom. I mean, it's a, it's a mountain, right? But um, we were successful in getting more support to um, pay the fees for teachers to take the PD. It's a- Congratulations. I know you've been struggling you. for that for a long time. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't get more support for our salaries. So <laughs> the need, this is a small victory in, in a sea of, you know, you need victories, but, but people are eager to support the teachers, which is great. And, um, you know, I know we're hitting record, but it's a ridiculous circle of if the granting agencies had funded us enough to do our work, which is the case it used to be, we would have never eated, needed to introduce the fees. We introduced the fees, on the, put it on the backs of teachers so that we could keep our programs going. But then lo and behold, they're like, oh, it seems like those fees could be a barrier to participation. It's like, well, yes, yes it is. So then more money was found to reduce the fees. So that's how we got more money. <laughs> so anyway, the good news is more money's going to teachers reducing a barrier to participation at a time when how could we want to put one more barrier in front of them learning about earth science and bringing earth climate science back to their classrooms and data sets and um, as a result we're making more funded spots available where teachers don't have to pay anything and the teachers are responding and showing up even in these trying times so join me in celebrating awesome. good news yeah that's awesome wendy I wanted to ask, um, shifting from like the, the mutual aid and resources just around the topic of teacher compensation and. Um, oh, oh, can I build on that specific? Yeah, I, I, it's very open ended, just like any news from the field on like teacher compensation and like how teachers are doing with inflation and like any models of like shifting some of that structure where teachers are never compensated for what they're worth. Mine is a baby introduction to that, but I this is a point I meant to point out. So we secured more money to support teachers and some of that money, not just to pay their fees for the PD, but also to help them travel to engage in conferences and um, professional settings in the geosciences. A small amount is set aside for that. And I'm like on cloud nine, and I literally this week am having conversations with some teachers we want to support and the money I carved out, their requests are now larger than what I can do because we didn't include the cost of subs. And they're saying, I can't, you could yeah. hand me the money for travel and time and hotel, but if there's no money for subs, I still can't go. And even then I'm not sure I can get a subs because there are none. So mm. just that exact moment of, I can support you to go. And they're like, yeah, no unless you can also pay sub or, or find me a sub. And I'm like, okay, that is way out of the realm of my ability to find you yeah. a sub. And I'm yeah. not sure. You could be the sub, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, yeah. and to the question you just posed, I saw Sean's hand pop up and I bet people have a lot of thoughts. But my sense is, um, especially in the markets, states where teachers' salaries are already low, is that it's not good dealing with inflation not good. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, I building on that, I got excited, Wendy, when you said that, because our program um, before COVID, first of all, we needed to provide stipends for teachers to participate in these PD activities and experiences and institutes and so on um, before COVID and then definitely now. And um, what it, it takes a bit of uh, collaboration with funders and conversations that are really honest, like we want people to attend, but here's what's stopping them. So that barrier to participation angle is important. And then also showing the funder, look, these are the, this is the amount of the direct benefit going straight to that school, the teacher there, the classroom there, this, the, you know, the amount of funding when we get some, the majority of it actually goes straight to the community, not to us. We're doing our work, of course, and we have to pay for our time, but like the majority of that is actually going to pay for the teacher's time 
we had a one utility partner, for example, I was very excited um, that kind of, they took the argument further and I wanted to share this with you in case it's useful. And he said, and it was like the head of an energy services department at a big utility, a public utility. And he says, you know, we talked about our fellowship program and working with teachers to create curriculum that is institutionalized and formalized into their curriculum. And so he said, you know, I, I pitched to him, well, when we do this at B BEF, we fund, we pay teachers, you know, $5,000 to work with us for a year on this. It's a quite a lot of hours of commitment. Would you also be interested in following the same model? Because that's sort of what we're known for doing. And they were like, well, it wasn't because of what I said. He goes, well, we pay coaches for sports. We pay all these other people. We should absolutely pay them. And I didn't make that connection before. And he came to our training when we were launching that and kicking it off. And he was, he want, he got to be, I wanted him to do this too, but he was like, I'd, I'd love to deliver that message. I was like there when they did. And the teachers were just the kind of folks that go above and beyond all the time. And when he said that he was going to pay for their time, <laughs> I don't want to cry, but like the room's vibe was like, whoa, somebody here, a funder came to the training and said themselves like, no, we value you and your time. And nobody could speak until one teacher bravely, the TOSA bravely says, thank you for recognizing that because we do all this stuff extra, the community garden, we do all these things and we want to, but gosh, it sure is nice to be recognized. So mm, yeah, and talk about that. Yeah. yeah. And so having that, having that um, heart connection to a little bit, especially now with what's going on, it's probably really important if you get some funders on board and definitely if they're locally based funders, they care about that community. I don't say not to say that bigger funders don't. It's just that they that's their neighbors, you know, that's why they're they're so um forthcoming with that. But we've had big nationwide funders also support that too, because of the barrier to participation being so important and teachers being overwhelmed. And if they want their outcomes to happen and you're depending on teachers to make that happen, well, we should really support them, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also if that foundation wants their outcomes to happen, it's like, how are we going to make sure those outcomes occur? So we want to make sure we support our teachers fully. And so that's what we advocate for. So Wendy, thanks so much for bringing that up. It's really close to our heart. Yeah, thanks, Sean. One, another bright spot. They're small, but they're good. Yeah, Jim. Yes, um, so let's see, I'm meaning to supplement, not try to divert away from, uh, funding directly that goes to the teachers, as in salary and stipends and so on. Um, related to it, of course, is a, a ways the schools and the teachers are getting support that isn't directly money to the teachers, but um, w w one little one can be recognition, especially for younger teachers. When they, when communities, when even on a regional level, it's recognized that they're accomplishing something that is just way above and beyond, that's very helpful to their career. I mean, that's that's probably more important to them than $10,000 or something that they are recognized. I mean, like, you know, our teachers at Lowell getting recognized by the Mid-Atlantic Climate Education Conference, that's really good on your resume. <laughs> and that's re it really looks good to the school and the funders and, and everything on it. Um, but beyond it is that the, the kind of support that the schools and the teachers get, um, okay, there is, there are, Okay, uh, that does a school, do schools or the districts encourage or discourage having specialists come into their school and be able to, to do things? And that gets into a lot of our intersection. I mean, Reb, you and I, or our organizations, you know, ACE has done uh, the, the um, assemblies, right? It's so important to have specialty, specialists who come in, and then you get these incredibly higher levels of of activity that goes on in the schools. Um, at Lowell, it, it's not just myself who's a mentor and a, essentially a volunteer, but recognized as a teacher, as an educator. But there's at least one of the one of the parents is just an incredibly dedicated uh, teacher, and and that that allows Lowell to have these incredibly outstanding labs. I mean, it's nice to work with others that have that, but uh, where they have it. And then uh, in the Bay Area, there's a lot of funding that's um, that allows one again the events that are happening on the weekends that these parents go to and there's a lot of them but then there's also field trip hubs so there's places where uh, students can come and get real good lab incredible labs and all the transportation and the funding 
to it is paid for by regional uh, organizations and so on. So there's, I mean, there's, there's other, there's all these other forms of support in addition to actually direct money to the teachers. And I don't know, I mean, what I want to circle back to is just, again, Reb, recognizing the important, incredibly important role ACE has played in, in making it clear we need to have specialists and look what, you know, it can't, it, it doesn't always have to be, we're teaching teachers what to do for when they're always saying, I only got a couple hours, right? I mean, we need to always do that. That's where the bulk of our work and our bulk of our people are, but it's possible if there's um, work that goes on it. And NCSE, maybe, we, you know, at some point we can check in, how are you all balancing that, right? I mean, you know, that, that's it's hard to keep that going, but is, is you know, how much is that being accepted or do you have in your pilot programs and things? Um, yeah, we all want to learn from each other. Again, I'm kind of rattling on a little bit, but just uh, there's so many ways that can be that this support can be manifest. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks. Other thoughts? Any intel on teachers unions negotiating higher salaries or like anything on salaries? I, I haven't heard anything. I haven't myself. heard anything about that, but one of the things that I've been wondering, I've been hearing over and over again the past few days that th that there's a, a, a deficit of teachers. There's not enough teachers. A lot of schools are not filling all of their positions. Might that ultimately lead to an increase in salaries of teachers? I don't know if it's a transient thing or if it's something that's a long-term issue, but it might attract more people if they were paid better. Yeah. And people are leaving. The, the numbers so are hard. staggering. I heard things like, you know, 70,000 in one state and 60,000 in another state short, that many mm -hmm. teachers. I'm like, who's going to teach the children? Well, <laughs> Back yeah, to the so just Google people. teacher shortage and like, there's a Wall Street Journal article. There's like a, there's all sorts of, yeah. I've well, and we know, there. I mean, I know just anecdotally how many phenomenal experienced teachers stepped away after COVID was the final straw and they just said, I could be done now, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On the note of teachers unions and contracts, I know the DC teachers union just, uh, announced that they were at an impasse, that they made their best offer with DC public schools, which was rejected. And so now they are, you know, this, those teachers there, it's illegal for them to go on strike. So there isn't much that can be done, um, but it's an interesting process to watch. Um, they haven't had a cost of living raise in I think three years. So it's long overdue. <laughs> Yeah, I know just in my son's middle school, there's like a whole bunch of vacancies that they haven't filled yet. Will they just make bigger classes because of that? I'm just kind of wondering how they're going to deal mm -hmm. with it. School starts, I mean, between now and yeah. a month from now, most schools start. And they'll pack teacher, teacher schedules and give them an extra course and make a math teacher teach an art class or like something ridiculous. Depending upon the state, you know, there may be guidance that class size is limited to a certain size, and that may not be mm -hmm. an option. But in some states where that isn't the guidance, that yeah. you, know, you know they will. But none of that is ideal for learning, and we can hope that the outcome is higher salaries for an important job. Even when there is guidance on classroom size, there's often, you know, if there's an emergency and we have yeah. to put these many kids in, then we will and we'll do it for X amount of days, like it's permissible. Um, and I know from my own experience that what they will do is they'll double the one classroom and then they'll, you know, after 30 days or whatever it is, they'll slide some of those kids into another classroom and double that classroom and they'll just keep flipping kids back and forth. Um, you know, which creates problems for kids as far as routine and consistency and problems for parents as far as communication. And it's very, even with guidelines, there's always a loophole. Yeah. Carrie, were you a public school teacher? 
I was, and I left after COVID. Where did you, where did you teach? What grade did you teach? I taught middle school science uh, for Chicago public schools and for DC public schools. Yeah, case in point, I'm sorry. Hmm. I'm glad you're at NCSE now, but yeah. 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 No, I had, I mean, I was very lucky for DCPS. I taught for a, I mean, probably the most well-funded school in all of the district because it was in a very affluent area. Uh, so our budget was, it was huge. We had a lot of parents who were very generous, um, but there's a ton of inequities there too. More recently, there's been conversations about these kinds of donations should be spread throughout the district. Um, because it creates larger inequities. We didn't have an issue getting all of our students one-to-one -one with computers within days of being told that they were going to be going home for the rest of the year. And that wasn't the case um, throughout the rest of the district. Um, yeah, it's, you know, where can teachers turn? Is... Are you able to get, make sure that all of your students had internet at home? So the district, the district is a very unique place when it comes to that. If you are low income and they, the district literally does not care about documentation, of like status as far as citizenship or whether or not you have the documentation that you've arrived legally. If you can just prove that you are low income or no income, you have free internet available to you. And in addition to that, they put um, hotspots throughout the city for students to use at, um, different places. Our school also handed out hotspots, which again was because of the kind of budget that we were afforded because of our teacher, our, our parents. Um, when they cut the librarian position a few years ago, we funded a librarian just from donations from our parents. I mean, it's a very different world where I was in DC. Um, but again, right, like that's, that's not the norm. And where can teachers turn to is such a complex question. I, I mean, we've seen a lot of teachers within our own program that have been moving into other realms. One of our teachers just left the classroom for a 100% online, a public school online program, but you know, very, very different from what she had previously been doing. Thanks, Carrie. I don't think we need to do hands. I feel like we're a small enough group. Okay. Well, before I before I talk though, Sean, did you? I see your hand, so I want to respect if you have something to bring in. Sean, I mean, I could go after you. Sorry, I'm trying to navigate my mute because dogs are barking. Okay. So the um, why don't you go ahead now? Because I have a question, and then it might push the conversation a little bit off, not off topic, but like another aspect of the same capacity issue. So. Okay, well, thank, thank you. So, so this is a little bit of a question for Carrie too, getting experience from being a DC teacher. Um, fitting into, a, you know, I guess, I guess you'll see a little bit of um, my, my take on things a lot of times is maybe, you know, it's, it's whittling away at the edges or it's, it's finding the places that you can, you can successfully make some very important things happen, even if you can't go right down the middle. Um, what I want to bring up is DC, if I would think, is the city and the, re and the regional area where it tops the, the country in a place where potentially at least the museums are a major resource for schools in that, at the very, they're, they're, you know, the world class museums and you don't have to pay to go, right? I mean, you might have to pay to bus, but you don't have to pay and that's, that's a big difference. We've certainly found that the Smithsonian's have been incredibly welcoming to our students who want to take action on climate change not just not just learn about climate change not just come to the museum but work with the museums and to do that um so anyway please carry why don't i be quiet for a minute and get get your thoughts on that a little bit and then i'll, I'll bring up kind of oakland side of things of the role museums can play at at helping to to help at least help in some of the areas yeah i mean i'm familiar with your program, and I um, have recently brought it up within NCSE that it would be a central place for collaboration because one of the projects that we have going on is trying to incorporate more action plans for students that, that are friendly. And I can absolutely see 
not just in the DC area, but throughout. I mean, all, all communities have access to some kind of museum. Maybe that museum is a couple hours away, which is a shame, but something, right? Um, even in rural Georgia, where um, I didn't necessarily grow up, but I did spend a lot of time, they have places there which were museum-like. DC is unusual because of that, that there are so many museums uh, so you know densely packed together that are free for everyone. And in addition to that, there's a decent rail system that is free to students. So if you can get a, a principal to sign off, you can absolutely take a group of kids onto the subway and get them to the museum. And it's a free day for them, um, minus you know packing their own lunch. Um, and, you know, I have done that. I've taken hundred students at one time to the museum and it's worked, right? Um, I think there's potential there. I really do. I don't know what the, the tipping point would be for the growth of a, that kind of program into less urban areas where it is harder to get students to interact with those kinds of organizations. But I do believe there is opportunity there. And I think that those kinds of places are open to replacing their lights with LED lights, which I know is something that your kids have done, or even considering, you know, redoing their insulation or other larger project, projects, right? I, you know, I absolutely think that there's, potential there. I just don't know what, what it would take to make that kind of program grow. And, and, I, and absolutely, I guess for one is, I'll take the approach that if, if you can have one, two, three, four examples of what's possible and, we're, and you're a small organization, that's about all you can do anyway. So, you know, it, it, it's going to be another issue of like, how do you get that in 50, 50 states? And by the way, just also just noting, I don't want to be talking about museums and like not recognize Ingrid is like our major branch to that world from a staff person's point of view at PRI. Um, uh, with outside of museums, there are nature centers, there yep. are 4-H, you know, buildings, right? There are other places where students receive informal education that is, you know, necessary and that can be collaborations for these students, even national park sites or national monument sites that have some kind of visitor center is a great place to turn to as well. And there are so many national park sites. There's other organizations that you can pair with to get the funding to go to these kinds of places too. I know um, National Park Trust does a lot of funding for that. So there are other opportunities out there for, for students outside of museums. Um, and, and an example, uh... In California, uh, an interesting tie of at when as things were coming back, as the Bay Area Science Festival came back, we, we were just kind of getting right, right, as first time things had happened. Um, a student signed up and wanted to do the energy surveys. Well, the student is a intern or a, a galaxy explorer at Chabot Space and Science Center, which is an amazing high school and, and a high school program. While she was doing an energy survey at Chabot Space and Science Center, another intern comes up and wants to wants to take it up. And that's a person has at, at Oakland High School, a charter school. And that's often been the way it's worked in Oakland, that the, the teachers want to do things. The, the district tends to shut things down if it's not just part of the, you know, it's not just the same formula, the same stuff. You're not supposed to come up with anything creative and different. But then the schools, the students do it. And there's not too much the district can say about it. They're sort of amazed that, wait a second, we've got students who are leading climate education in action. Well, I can't, I don't have any control over them. And uh, so you see it's possible. But anyway, the museum, Chabot Space and Science Center kicked in of, of a place to have the, the relation. So, so Ingrid, anything you all have with PRI, I, I would definitely, uh, we definitely want to make sure the students are, you know, aware of, Friendly would be a, a tremendous understatement of the importance of your of Museum of the Earth. So, yes, and our nature center, the Cuga Nature Center, where we do a lot of climate change education there. But 
yeah, I mean, we're lucky in that sense that people trust museums. You know, there's a lot of trust that's dissolved for institutions, but people still trust museums and nature centers and zoos, uh, you know, and aquaria as sources of information. And um, I think for kids, often the most memorable part of their education is a field trip. I mean, I bet all of you could probably remember a field trip you went on decades ago maybe something you learned from it or just the, the good feeling you got from it. So that's an advantage we have. We are at time, everyone. Sean, I think you, you still have your hand up. Um, I do have to hop off also, but for those of you who wanna stay on, please feel free if you wanna continue the conversation a few more minutes. Thanks. A lot. I'm going to have to leave also, but thanks a lot. for right. the conversation. It was good to see you all. Thanks, Brad. Take good care. Thanks, everyone.